You could also make the case that almost no one was prepared to be president. But boy, he had a lot facing him. He had two wars to end, you know, and that was just, just for starters. And then he was informed about this bomb, this, this extraordinary new weapon. That was my guest, Jeffrey Frank, who joined us to speak about his ambitious new book, The Trials of Harry S. Truman, The Extraordinary Presidency of an Ordinary Man. I'm Mark Lawrence, director of the LBJ Presidential Library. And I'm Mark Updegrove, president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. And this is With the Bark Off. When it comes to writing about American politics, few authors are as accomplished or as versatile as Jeffrey Frank. Jeffrey is an eminent journalist, having served as senior editor at The New Yorker and deputy editor of the Washington Post Outlook section. His work has appeared in publications such as The New Yorker and The Wall Street Journal. Jeffrey has also published four novels that dissect the social world of elite Washington. In 2013, Jeffrey turned to presidential history, publishing Ike and Dick, Portrait of a Strange Political Marriage, a best-selling account of the partnership between President Eisenhower and his vice president, Richard Nixon. Jeffrey joined me to talk about his latest book, the first study in many years to tell the story of the Truman presidency. Well, Jeffrey Frank, congratulations on your new book, and thank you so much for joining me on this episode of With the Barkoff. It's wonderful to have you. Harry Truman has been the subject of a number of biographies over the years, although not, it's fair to say, in, in some years. How does your book build on or depart from those earlier studies of Harry Truman? Yeah, I mean, it isn't, you know, it's, it's biography of a presidency. Um, I, I deal with, I deal with his, his early life and sort of a, a long introduction, you know, where he was born, where he was from, but, but it's, it's a biography of, of a presidency. And it's also, I think there's a lot to be learned. It's been almost 30 years since the last David McCullough's wonderful book came out in 1992. And, uh, and, and, and there have been other, other books, Robert, Robert Farrell's uh, very, very sort of serious study, but there's been, there's a lot to be learned. The, the archives and independents are, are, are wonderful. Um, there have been so many memoirs published, diaries published. Um, and then there's an awful lot to be learned about the Korean War, which is about, and still a lot to be learned. I, I became, I don't want to use the word, obs- yeah, I became obsessed by the Korean War because the more I got into it, the more I saw it as a sort of, I, I, I saw the, the sort of pattern that we actually have gotten into since. I, I thought of, I was actually beginning to think the, the parallels between Truman and LBJ are pretty interesting. Both of them came, were accidental presidents, and both of them got into these horrible Asian wars. There were other great, there are big differences with those two, and both, and those, in both cases, those wars did a lot of damage to their presidencies. Yeah, I, I love this idea that there's still a lot to be learned about uh, a part of history that that is uh, now well more oh, than yeah. half a century old, um, and no doubt the 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 um, excitement of of rediscovering those those periods was one of the factors that drew you to Harry Truman as a subject. But talk a little bit about uh, the broader set of reasons that led you to write about Harry Truman. Some of them are personal. I, I grew up in Washington, uh, D.C. Um, my, the, my earliest recollection of a president was Harry Truman. My father worked in the Pentagon, and, and I had no idea what he did. I'm still am not quite sure what, what he did there, but I was aware he, he hadn't served in the war because he, he'd had polio as a child. So that's, I think that's, that's why they, they came down to Washington. He wanted to do his part. And I, and I was aware at one point that suddenly he was going to work on Saturdays. That was, of course, when the Korean War broke out in, in June of 19, 1950. And uh, and also the period so the period fascinates me and I had done one earlier book that covered some of it uh, it was called Ike and Dick uh, the the relationship between Richard Nixon and Dwight D Eisenhower which and uh, and so I I looked at th- and a lot of there was a lot of overlap between that period and the Truman era so I sort of looked at Truman as also in a way sort of a prequel uh, a lot of the a lot of the questions that were that, that that were raised during Truman's presidency remained and particular and certain things sort of grew the I mean what one thinks of of the McCarthy era as 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 Truman but no and actually it was Eisenhower when it reached its great Eisenhower's presidency where it reached its climax and it's and self-destructed and uh, so this but but the, but the whole Red Square went went started anyway there's so much that that began in in the Eisenhower Nixon period and uh, uh, but actually began during the Truman era it seems to me assessments of Harry Truman's presidency have been really 
all over the map over the years. He, of course, left the presidency with very low poll ratings. In more recent times, I think it's fair to say that historians and others have seen him in a much more favorable light. Broadly speaking, where do you come down in the trials of Harry Truman? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, the, these ratings are kind of silly in some way. I think, I mean, he's generally put in the category of near great. And I would certainly put him, I guess I'd put him in the category in, in, a, in a pretty pretty high high rating. And certainly in the rating of he, he did his best, he was an honorable man. Man. Um, the great, I think our great presidents, we can all agree on two of them, Lincoln and, and, and George Washington. And I, I would sort of put, and I would put FDR uh, there too. And after that, it, after that, we argue about it. Truman himself, um, you know, had, I think he might change his mind. He was very, very, he was soft on Andrew Jackson, who was held in great disfavor today by, by many people. He actually had, was kind of soft on Andrew Johnson, who was a horrible president. And, I, and I'm sure Truman would, 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 would reassess these views. So I think that changes mm-hmm. all the time. I think Truman's going to, we're going to remain thinking fairly well, Truman, partly because he, because of, of, of the, of the quality of, 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 of the man himself. And, and also the, also what was accomplished during his, his presidency. For what is it, you know, the, he, he was, as he was leaving office, there was a lot of, you know, he was definitely not wildly popular, but even before he left, some historians began to see that he really, they was, he was something. Henry Steele Commager did a piece in Look magazine in, in 1950, 1951, when, and that was a period when Truman was not having a good time. He, there were, there was, he was being sort of attacked for all kinds of s- scandals. They, by, by today's standards, they were pretty petty, but they were, but they were real enough. And of course, the war in Korea. And, and, and Commager wrote, well, yeah, but the things that we're looking at are pretty venial sins when we look at them at the major accomplishments that happened during his presidency we will begin to think we begin to think certainly more highly of him and and that that uh, that that view is held there, there's a view of Harry Truman that it seems to me has really stuck over the years that that he was in other words this this sort of simple midwesterner who really lacked sophistication yeah. but in but possessed a kind of homespun wisdom that actually proved very valuable um, in the difficult times after the Second World War, is there value in seeing Harry Truman in that way? I think you know. I think Truman himself cultivated this. He he, he began to he began to play this character, Harry Truman, uh, this sort of mid the sort of mid midwestern uh, straight talking guy. No, he was yeah, there's some value in it. But Truman was very much aware of what was going. On. He was he was a really smart guy. He wasn't he he might not have been wildly. Uh, Highly educated in a, in a formal sense, but he, he he knew what was going on, and he, so yeah. But you can look at it in a way that, that was his defense mechanism, the mm-hmm. the old simple, simple simple Harry Truman. That wasn't. He was a very sophisticated man, and he really knew, and he was very very aware of of what was going on in the world, and also he was very well aware of his own image, and, and could be highly as as any president, he could be highly sensitive to the way he was being treated. Yeah, you show, I think, at a few points, at least in the book, that he was actually quite capable of deception um, and, uh, you know, other kinds of behaviors that were very much at odds with that straight talking buck stops here president. Yeah, I don't think, by the way, the buck stops here uh, plaque, which you can actually buy at the Truman Library. I, I'm not quite, it was never in his office. <laughs> it, I, it was probably somewhere in the White House. I'm not quite, not quite sure where. The other thing about Truman, by the way, is that he, he was, he got along pretty well with the press. The, the press reporters liked him. He liked them. Now, he did not like colonists. He he really didn't like them. He really had he really had it in for, for for say Walter Lippmann, who was sort of this, you know, this I said this ivory tower guy. He saw and the, the and there were there were two very pop very powerful colonists, Joe Alsop and Stu Alsop, and Truman began to refer to them as the Sop sisters, <laughs> and uh, and he he really did. But he got along with reporters, and I say I think in some way they were they were very much the same. Reporters in those days were not like they they were they were regular guys. All, many of them didn't go to college. Um, many of them were. Uh, and they were just hardworking, low-paid, low-paid men and women, or mostly men, and and they liked Truman, as I say, and Truman and Truman liked him and understood them. So, and that and that that contributed a lot to the to, to the good press he got. A lot is made of the fact that Harry Truman, you know, didn't go to college, didn't have, you know, the educational credentials we might expect of a, a, a president. Um, but you but you show, I think, in the book that he often drew on history, that he was well-read. Talk a little bit, if you would, about his, his intellectual life, his, his preparation for becoming president. 
Well, he he actually he said that when he was when he was very young, he read every book in the Independence Library. I don't believe that, <laughs> but he was a very he was a serious reader. He read all the time. He was particularly interested in 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 the Civil War, and he was particularly interested in in, in presidencies. And uh, and while he was in the White House, he would actually talk about it. he would talk about hearing hearing the ghosts of of of, of Andrew Johnson or the ghosts of so and so walking clanking through the corridors as if I mean he so he was very very aware of history and it was and and the importance of understanding the job and. And, and the past, so he was, and uh, and I so said, and that never stopped. He would even get into sort of correspondence with with reporters who who, who would send him, uh, so send him, send him thoughts. And he he began to see analogies with U.S. history and Greek and Roman history. Some of it, I think, a little far fetched, but but he was a deep reader of history and a very serious reader of history. Uh, undoubtedly, one of the most remarkable things about Harry Truman is that such an ordinary man, to use the phrase you use in the subtitle of your book, became vice president and then in April of 1945 president. Why did Franklin Roosevelt choose this, on the face of it, unlikely figure to be his vice president? Well, actually, he was—he—he he, he was actually. It became more and more a likely figure. Truman had. I mean, Roosevelt had. Furthermore, was had been sort of boxed in by two people he didn't want. One of them was his current vice president, Henry Wallace. Everyone wanted to think he, he needed to get rid of him. Henry Wallace was, to put it, he was something of, of a flake. He was, uh, he believed, he, 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 his personal belief system was a mixture of, of Zoroastrianism and, and, uh, and, and, and various, various major religions and so on. He was also extremely, I, I, he was his feelings toward the Soviet Union were extremely friendly. He he was certainly not a not a fellow traveler, but 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 some people regarded him as such, and, and people so people regarded him as a as a as a dangerous choice to sort of see America through in the post war world. The other choice was someone was James Francis Burns, Jimmy Burns, everyone called him, who was an interesting guy. Uh, Roosevelt had promised him the vice presidency, but Roosevelt like other presidents could lie and he lied to lied to Jimmy Burns. Jimmy Burns by the way was a he was one of these interesting figures that we don't have people like him today. He was um he said Truman never went to college. Jimmy Burns never finished high school. Mm-hmm. And yet Jimmy Burns ran for Congress, ran for the Senate, won. And uh, Roosevelt appointed him to the US Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> and and his qualifications for that he had he had been he had learned shorthand as a young man his, his his mother had made sure that he learned he became a court reporter then then went to law school another night school and and practiced law but that he'd never been a judge and that and and so he was on the supreme court the job bored him and uh, sort of, and Roosevelt then asked him to take over, to basically handle his d- domestic policies during the Second World War. He became known as a, the assistant president, uh, a, a, a title that, I mean, a, a name that that really ticked off Roosevelt. Nevertheless, so he was considered wild, really qualified, and he was a, but he he was uh, he was a racist. He was against the anti-lynching law, and uh, the NAACP wouldn't have him. Labor hated him, and so Roosevelt was never going to give him the job. So that was, and so so then there was Truman. Here's a, a border state guy. He was okay with labor. He'd actually had made kind of a name for himself while he was a senator. He hadn't done much in the first term, but in the second term, he had formed and asked to form this 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 committee to sort of watch over. Oh, I need to use the the sort of the modern free, clean, race, waste, fraud, and abuse in the defense mm-hmm. industry. And that started before the war. And then he kept it up. He was on the cover of Time magazine as a man who'd saved the nation millions. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a bad choice, it, and uh, so it was a choice to offend no one. FDR and Truman seem, on the face of it at least, to be such different personalities. You know, the straight-talking Truman versus this sort of sphinx-like figure, FDR. Um, how, talk about their relationship. How did, how did they get along with each other? There wasn't one. I mean, they they uh, they knew each other. Roosevelt had when Roosevelt, Roosevelt would have before the war. The, the Roosevelts would have these huge parties. I think Truman was invited to one. Best didn't want to come. Best didn't much like that. Didn't much like that scene. Um, they had the Roosevelt and Truman had one lunch together before after the after the 1944 convention and before the campaign. And that was it. That was, the, as far as I can tell, that was their only face-to-face meeting. They, they, they met several other times at the White House in, in connection with cabinet meetings and others and in groups of, uh, groups of, of congressmen or senators, but they, didn't, they did not know each other at all. And it was so little that when, when after the inauguration, two days after the inauguration, Roosevelt was gone. He went to, he went to Yalta to meet with Chal- Stalin and Churchill. And he left a note for Truman, well, if you must get in touch with me, don't call, don't <laughs> Don't write. Use the pouch, and basically the the word the subtext was don't bother me. 
<laughs> and then he came back, gave, 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 he was very, very tired. He came back after, after he also gave his speech at the beginning of April and then went down to, went, went to Warm Springs, Georgia, and, and 12 days later he was dead of, of a cerebral mm-hmm. hemorrhage. The only correspondence that I can find between them was Truman asking him for, for some patronage for, for, uh, for, for his friend uh, um, uh, who, who had helped him, helped him win the, uh, the, the senatorial election in 1944. Mm-hmm. So when, when FDR died in, uh, on April 12, 1945, Harry Truman suddenly becomes president, and it seems to me he was deeply unprepared for that office, having been kept largely in the dark about many of the most important issues that FDR was dealing with on a yeah. daily basis. Is it fair to say that he was really in the dark about the most important questions of the day? Oh, yeah, he, he really was. I mean, I mean, the most famous in the darkness, and this has been written about a lot, I, that he, no one even bothered to tell him about the atomic bomb, uh, that this thing was, 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 was being developed and, and as, as, as a sort of great weapon to end the war. He wasn't, he wasn't involved in much of anything. And he, um, so yeah, he was in the dark. Um, what, what, to his, what, was, what worked for his, to his advantage was he was a, he was a good student. He, he, he studied hard and he, and he got up to speed as far as, as probably as fast as anyone who in his position could have, could have gotten. And you could also make the case that almost no one could have been president or was prepared to be president. But boy, he had a lot facing him. He had two wars to end. And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, and that was just, just, just for starters. And then, and then he was informed about this bomb, this, 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 this extraordinary new weapon. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the trials that Harry Truman faced, especially in the arena of of foreign policy. And clearly there yeah. were an awful lot of them um, in this momentous period of um, of history. Above all, he, you know, he faced the challenges of ending the Second World War and shaping the new international order that would follow after the fighting was finished. And in, 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 these, in, the, in these tasks, he had to interact with some of the real giants of the period, Winston Churchill, Clement Attlee, uh, and above all, of course, Joseph Stalin. How did he do in in interactions with these larger than life figures? He um, one thing that gave him a great step up. I mean, he did he did okay. Um, he, when he when he went to meet with Stalin and Churchill for the first time in in Potsdam, the suburb of Berlin, the first day the first day he he met Churchill on I think on the morning of July sixteenth. He arrived on the fifteenth and took a tour. Of Berlin, look at the wreckage of this place. Visited the, the wreckage of Hitler's chancery, and and but then later that day he found that was when he learned that this this bomb, this atomic bomb, this first one ever tested, had been a great success. It was in the, the Trinity test, and that gave him a lot of self confidence. He he he, regardless of of his own shortcomings, whatever they were, he realized he understood that America was now the world's only superpower. It was the America was was the was going to be the leader of the what what became known as as, as the free world, and uh, and that gave him a lot of confidence. It also it also and, and this this American dominance by by its wealth by its power made a big difference. Roosevelt um, when he met with Churchill, Churchill basically came to him almost as a supplicant. He said, "This is a this is a melancholy time for us. We may need some time to to, to settle our financial affairs." Um, he was almost. I, I compared it at one point to a, a senator asking for 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 aid after after a hurricane had struck his state. Um, that that was the, the state. And so so Truman was. I mean, Churchill was almost something of a supplicant. Also, true. Also, Churchill was facing an election um, at ten days after he arrived in Potsdam to meet with with Truman and and, and Stalin. Churchill was out of office. He was voted out of office by the by, by by Labour in the UK, and that sort of threw things off a little bit. Stalin Stalin regarded Tr- Tr- Truman, I think, as a as a little man with a big bomb, but he treated him with respect mostly. Hmm. Truman Truman looked at Stalin as sort of he compared him to 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 Boss Pendergast, this political boss in in Missouri. He was not Boss Pendergast. Boss Pendergast was not a homicidal leader. <laughs> boss candidate. Boss and 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 Stalin. Stalin had those had those homicidal tendencies among other things, but 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 Stalin was Stalin Stalin was someone who really knew how to control control his country, control his people. He controlled his secret police, and and they got along okay um, until they didn't. Uh, not uh, Stalin got along very well with Roosevelt. But they kind of understood each other. Truman Truman was still learning, and I th- and I th- they they got off to an awkward start right from the start. Uh, 
when Truman sort of um, sort of scolded uh, Molotov, the Stalin's foreign minister, in their first meeting. But so it was a rocky a rocky relationship. It never it but but it so it never was never good. And then it got then I say then it got not not so good after a while. Through misunderstanding of Stalin or 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 any other missteps, I wonder did Harry Truman miss any opportunities to avoid the Cold War to to put the the world that is on a more peaceful path if he had made different decisions? Yeah, I mean there must be must be a million historians who debated this question. I I think that I think that some things were inevitable. I think the I think the arms race was inevitable. Stalin, the Russians wanted their own ad, atom bomb, and, and they were already they were aware of ours before we told them. They have they had pretty good espionage, and they and they uh, and they were already the way to developing it. And then once the once the, and so therefore there was going to there was always going to be an arms race, and there was always going to be a sort of territorial rivalry. I don't know that I don't know that that some of it was necessary i know that i know i'm pretty sure that there did not need to have been a, Co- a korean war stalin was in, went along with 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 kim's wish for it but i but i think that but i think that he but he didn't want to have russia involved and i think that did not have to happen but but we don't we don't know the uh, certainly the chinese never never would have been involved if we had listened to our own intelligence but it's it's hard to tell the berlin airlift i don't i don't know the berlin crisis may not have ever happened but i think that there again roosevelt was sort of more inclined to sort of to spheres of influence let let the, the polish question which was a question might not have happened if roosevelt had had lived the polish question was pretty simple there'd been two two different governments as the war ended. The one, the so-called London Poles, mm-hmm. were, 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 and, and then there were the, the Lublin Poles, basically the Soviet, the, the Soviet, the, the, those who favored Soviet control. And Stalin said, oh, sure, we could have everyone involved in a post-war government. But Stalin lied. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, Truman, certainly, Truman found out, I mean, learned pretty quickly that Stalin wasn't telling the truth. Harriman was very, J. Avril Harriman, who was the ambassador to the Soviet Union, was very upset by this. He And he rushed home to tell Truman, watch out, watch out. But, and I don't know. I mean, we, we, I don't know. I really don't know. And I really don't, my, my suspicion is that it would have been a Cold War, but it might not have been quite so, quite so, might not have veered so, so much toward hotness as it did. If, but there would have been a rivalry. Yeah. If FDR had had lived through his, had his lived. term, there would have been a rivalry, but perhaps not not so fierce a rivalry at first. Right. But it would have. Right. I think some some of it was probably inevitable, simply because here were here were two great countries who were two had different who had different agendas and had two very different systems. So the, the, the communism was a, it was a very different system in the, the, than ours. And and Stalin was pretty open about about the you know about the saying the future the future is our way, not not your way. So something would have happened. You mentioned a few minutes ago the decision about the A-bomb, speaking of subjects that a million historians have written about. Um, where do you come down on this enormously charged question of why Harry Truman decided to use the bomb? Was it just about ending the war? Was there, um, in addition, a goal of intimidating the Soviets? It was, I think it was totally to end the war. I think I think people saw this sort of this sort of extra this sort of extra benefit. Yeah, it it it, it, it might intimidate the Soviets, but that wasn't the reason for it. It's I, um, the the bomb the bomb was going to be used no matter no matter what. I mean, I think there was it was already set in motion under under Roosevelt's time. The so-called interim committee, which was which is the committee that made the decision whether to go ahead or not, they'd already decided there was the, the memoirs written by members of the inter- interim committee, which I, I which were quite interesting. There was never any dissent. No one ever questioned that they should go ahead with this with this thing. And then after they decided to go ahead, the target committee, which which was which met as early as sort of May, I think it was May 1945, a couple of months before the bomb was dropped, they they chose Kyoto as the as the prime target, and uh, and uh, if you've ever been to Kyoto, this is this beautiful beautiful city the city of shrines and temples and and beautiful houses and so on it had been the emperor's residence for a, a thousand years and uh henry stimson the secretary of war who'd been there went to truman and said don't do it um they will never never forgive us if we bomb kyoto and that sort of 
so and that was sort of Truman's major decision to take Kyoto off the list, and and, uh, and 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 then Hiroshima became the the number one target, but that was that was pretty well settled, and and Truman gave the order on 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 July twenty fifth, and then the bomb was dropped on the sixth. There was never and there was never going back. Truman was told by by Secretary Secretary Marshall and others that we would save half a million lives if we didn't have a land invasion. That's not true. There would not have been anything like that that I mean, like that sort of casualties. But but they definitely. A, the idea that we were facing a hated enemy, Japan, who had attacked us in Pearl Harbor, um, the president in wartime was was going to not try to do anything he could to save American lives, a silly, a silly proposal. I mean, of course, it had to happen, and Truman never doubted that he had done the right thing. The bomb in Nagasaki is another question, um, but I'm not even, it's so hard to tell who actually gave the order. I think it was, this, this that bomb was already in motion by, mm-hmm. and, and three days later, it, it was going to happen no matter what. So really, we... We make a mistake, perhaps, in using the word decision. Uh, there was so much momentum. There were so many assumptions built into the Manhattan Project that uh, there was no real decision to be made, perhaps, in the middle of 1945. I think so. You can say that Truman gave the order, and he would actually, in his, in his, in his memoirs, he would say, I gave the order, and he, he owned it. And uh, but uh, but there was no but and if, if he could have called it off conceivably. That's what I when I say that there's the idea. But the idea that a that a president of three in, after three months in wartime would have called off anything that could have ended the war quickly it's, it's inconceivable. There's if you want to hear some more about the bomb, I got really interested. There was I, I put it as a long footnote, but I I kind of wish I put it in the main text now. Louis Strauss, who became the later became the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, um, there there were some thoughts that perhaps this thing could be demonstrated, and the Japanese would just would be so frightened they'd give up. And and the, Strauss had this idea that the bomb could be dropped on this on the Nikko Forest. It was this place where these really tall cedar trees grew, mm-hmm. and the idea was that he would give a warning, and the bomb would be dropped there, and the people then the the residents would return and see the sight of these these huge trees lying out like a like a windrow caused by the by the blast and uh it, anyway that never happened it was an intriguing idea but i i don't I, would it have worked i doubt it and it, but it was but i but that was the sort of thing that was being talked about after the bomb was dropped then there was there were a lot of a lot of people said oh my god we shouldn't have done it but it's, it's unimaginable that they wouldn't have done it sure and you you um you mentioned that Harry Truman actually felt some guilt in in later years about his his use of the bomb. He felt how's it guilt? He felt mm-hmm. he felt he felt that I mean he he, he knew it, it was a horrible thing. One time he, I think he mm-hmm. said to Henry Wallace, I, "I don't want to kill any more kids." Uh, mm-hmm. But it wasn't it was not guilt, but it was it was an awareness of of the destruction he had caused. He was also aware, by the way, that the bomb, sure. in terms of of in terms of the numbers of of deaths was was nothing compared to the to the firebombing of Tokyo, for example, which would have been which have been going on already. But uh, but but this, yeah. this the bomb was a unique and singular weapon, and Antietam was aware of its power, and uh, so he was never felt guilty. But he certainly was. Yeah. See, he, he certainly was haunted by it. Sure. And his I, I may have I, I've mentioned elsewhere that his grandson, who I got to know slightly, Clifton Daniel, really interesting guy. He was he became quite obsessed by the bomb and interested in it. And he made several trips to Hiroshima, and uh, and and he um, and he actually was in. In, in I was in the Independence when when one of the survivors of of the attack um, gave one of the famous folded cranes to the museum and and mm-hmm. Clifton Daniel was there to receive it and uh, very very moving in a way and they they, they embraced each other and and, uh, and it was it was interesting but there but so the bombs certainly haunted haunted the, even Truman's descendants but there was, I don't think guilt is the word fair enough. Um, Turning to the, the the Cold War more generally, it seems to me the Truman administration is often credited with remarkable ingenuity in creating new institutions to preside over the post-war world. So the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the United Nations, ultimately NATO, and of course the Marshall Plan itself involved the establishment of new bureaucracies. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about how those decisions uh, were made. To what extent was Harry Truman deeply uh, involved in those kinds of decisions? Was or was this really the work of men like Marshall and Atchison? Um, Truman 
Truman was 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 involved to some extent in all of them, to lesser extent in some of them. He was um, he was, um, but he was deeply he was he he was deep, deeply supportive of them. He was um, I, I think the Marshall Plan is something where perhaps he was least involved. Uh, that the Marshall Plan, uh, the Marshall Plan was sort of conceived by uh, who any number of people who were working at the State Department. Um, it was I think it was drafted by by Charles by Chip Bolin. Um, it was Marshall himself had 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 been very affected by the by the by the by the sights he'd seen in in post-war Europe, and um, and 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 I think there was an understanding uh, that something needed to be done to sort of just to sort of build this place up that 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 would have turned into. And there was also some self-interest, of course, for our we 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 would have we sort of wanted that market back, but it was but it was a genuinely benign and 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 well-meaning policy, an extraordinarily generous policy, and as say. Um, and Truman was a little bit worried about it. He wasn't really brought into it at first. He, I think the, the the extraordinary expense of it alarmed him slightly. And before Marshall gave his famous speech at Harvard in 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 1947, um, he hadn't even told shown Truman the final draft of the speech. He 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 apologized for it later on, and Truman said, "Oh, don't worry about it." And uh, Truman Truman and 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 Truman meant it. Don't worry about it. And uh, and but one of the prime movers of the Marshall Plan, by the way, were Republicans. Um, Arthur Vandenberg, the, the Republican senator of Michigan, was extraordinarily important and influential in getting it passed. And even even some congressmen, some some sort of anti you know, people think of them these sort of rabid anti-communist congressmen now, but they weren't. Uh, Richard Nixon, the the, the con- freshman congressman from California, had went toured Berlin with this with Christian Herder's special committee to sort of assess the damage in Europe, and he became a strong advocate of the Marshall Plan. And so it was a, it was a truly bipartisan thing, and, and Truman certainly mm. in, certainly endorsed it, got behind it, and took credit for it, as he should have. NATO NATO was a huge deal also, and Truman understood that pretty quickly, that this was something, this, this alliance, he gave it, he compared it to a neighborhood watch group, and said, think of it, think of it as, as neighbors helping each other. And it's sort of interesting to think that this was, this was what, this was what NATO was then. It was, it was this, 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 this France, um, uh, uh, the, the Scandinavian countries, the UK, and so, and, 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 uh, and Truman, uh, and, and the US, and uh, when you think of what NATO has since become, it's, 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 there's very little resemblance to what it was right after the war, when it was a post-war neighborhood watch group to prevent aggression by the Soviet Union. And that was and that was a that was a very that, and that that endures today and that which is interesting and so and and the effect of the Marshall Plan endures today, and the UN endures today not not to the extent that it did then the the UN is uh, as you know has been has been uh, sorry, trashed and supported for for years. Dean Acheson even at the beginning thought it was a sort of silly organization, but he thought he thought it had its purposes and he was and, and he said he said the right thing, but the but yeah these these are things Truman can take credit for, and should. Surely the biggest trial that Harry Truman faced arose in June of 1950, the Korean War. Um, You mentioned a few minutes ago in passing that perhaps a different set of decisions earlier could have headed off the war. Can you elaborate on that point? Yeah, I mean, I think the war. I, 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 I should explain that more. I think the war was there was going to be a, a Korean War. The, the, um, Kim Il Sung wanted to unify the, the peninsula under under his regime, and he and that that was and 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 he actually had met with Stalin, who said, "Oh, go ahead, try it." And 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 that sort of led to this blitzkrieg at the end of June of 1950, and 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 uh, and, and that's when that's when. When Truman was presented with the idea, how do we respond to this? And Truman, Truman did. Truman, and pretty quickly realized that we, we probably, probably we needed to do something, and and we did. And so so he ordered a, a military response. He got General MacArthur, who was the the Pacific commander, to to, to send to send to send troops. And he and, and and most importantly, he got the UN. He 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 sent the the ambassador to the UN to 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 get a commitment to from you and to support to to condemn this aggression from the north and he built an alliance oh, not not unlike what george h w bush did after the uh, after iraq occupied kuwait mm. and that's what and that's how the war began and that's how the war uh, and that's and that's what that's actually been my analogy i I've, I've, I've realized the, the korean war could have ended like gulf war 1 mm-hmm. it could have ended mm-hmm. with a with a with a with a quick defeat of the North, which happened after General MacArthur's first and last great military victory in Korea, which was the Incheon landing in September of 1950. In this, by, by early summer of 1950, the North had 
was occupied had occupied one ninety percent of the country. It was it, it was it looked like a catastrophic defeat for the, for the United States and its allies. But that turned around, and uh, and and uh, we also had we also had the advantage of heavy bombing. We used napalm, and other and other weapons, and we and we could turn it around. This this MacArthur's. Inchon Landing was a brilliant military maneuver, and it was, and and, and it came, and it, and and it, 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 what it did was again it turned the war around the other way, and by the by by the time it was over in September, the the, the North was in retreat, and we and the and the South looked like it could have, or and the Allies were really very close to victory, and that's when we probably could have declared victory and the war could have ended, but that's when MacArthur sort of took over the war and decided he was well why not why not why not occupy the country why not take over the country and unify the country uh, on our terms mm-hmm. and that's when it all went bad there were there were there was intelligence from 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 china don't don't cross the 30th parallel that was the sort of dividing line that had been in effect since since the end of the war and uh and and uh and if you do that you know we're going to get involved and um and and macarthur macarthur didn't want to do that truman truman the the the, the uh the UN authorized the sort of to, to keep go, to head to go north, and when that happened, the war the war turned around, and then it became it became MacArthur's war. It became a whole different kind of war, and then it became a much bigger war. The war, I you know, I, you can't prove it, but uh, more and more scholarship shows that that from, uh, research into into these archives, uh, particularly particularly opening up the archives in, in the Soviet Union, and and also in, in, in from Korean scholars, the war could have ended then, and 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 if and if the U.S. had not had listened to their warning, the warnings from China, from Joe and Lai, and not done that, the war probably could have ended in September. Instead, what happened was the war went on for three years. It cost 37,000 American lives, um, it, probably hundreds of thousands of Korean lives, maybe a couple of million Chinese lives. It led to complete destruction in every town and village in North in North Korea. Um, there was a sort of almost a, a carpet bombing by, with, by, by heavy aircraft and so on. And, and to such an extent that, that one can understand why the Koreans, why, why the Koreans wouldn't were so angry at us, and why they're so almost un- unforgiving toward, toward toward us. There was such such destruction. MacArthur himself, when he later, when he was relieved of his command and testified to Congress and to, and to the origins of the war, said it was such a sight that made me want to vomit. And uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the death and destruction he saw, and, and which was horrendous. And there was a big. De- it was interesting to think. I mean, the as I say, then it became Gulf War Two. Suddenly, it, be- it became about a matter of re- regime change. Rather than pushing the Koreans out of the South, which could have happened much more easily and quickly. Right, right. Let's talk a little bit about the domestic arena. Your book is largely concerned with foreign policy, but you, of course, do uh, uh, pay some attention to the the domestic side of things. You, it seems to me, you are fairly critical of Truman in connection with the Red Scare, McCarthyism, and the loyalty programs that were initiated under Truman's leadership. Um, Am I right in in reading your tone as um, fairly harsh in in connection with uh, Truman's behavior on this issue? Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought that was I thought that was a low point of his presidency. He didn't have to do this. He he gave an executive order to basically, basically to form the 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 employee loyalty federal employee loyalty uh, program, and that was basically what that required was that every federal employee was going to be subjected to an investigation to fingerprinting by the FBI, and there were two million employees then, which basically put the made made everyone slightly slightly paranoid who worked in worked in Washington in the federal government, and I say there were two 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 million people, and that and and it turned out they they basically almost nobody was affected by them. people were people were loyal people and and there was no reason for this there there were there, there was I mean there I, I, Truman Truman didn't begin the the Red Scare the the Hollywood the so-called Hollywood Ten investigation was going on but this came in, this came long before MacArthur McCarthy Senator McCarthy's famous speech in Wheeling which wasn't until February 1950. That was the speech where, where Senator McCarthy said, "I, we, I have a list of communists work or f- working in communist sympathizers working in the, in the in the Department of State and so on." So you could almost some people argue that Truman helped help launch McCarthy's uh, um, red hunting thing and so on. I think that's unfair, but but Truman was certainly part of the problem, and he was, and I think that he uh, he he basically and he also took. T- he had two sides of this. He would he would say privately that J. Edgar Hoover. Well, he I'm afraid he's going to start an American Gestapo. But he never said anything like that to J. Edgar Hoover. He said it to his to Bess. He said it to a couple of days like Clark Clifford. But he never he he never really took on J. Edgar Hoover uh, uh, on on that issue ever. So Harry Truman came into 
high office as vice president to Franklin Roosevelt, the man of the New Deal. One might think that he would have embraced that slogan, New Deal, and carried on with um, core priorities of the great Franklin Roosevelt. But as you, as you point out in the book, Harry Truman was somewhat uncomfortable with that label and with what the New Deal signified. Where should we think about, how should we think about Harry Truman in connection with this great liberal explosion of the 1930s? Think of Truman as a moderate Democrat. He, he was he was in the Joe Manchin, but because 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 he he endorsed all these programs, but he he but he he really wasn't comfortable with these with 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 these with the sort of elite Easterners as he as, as he saw them. The, the 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 Truman administration really moved west. It moved from the Hudson River to the to to, to the Mississippi, mm-hmm. and, and 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 the, the Missouri River. Um. So there was um. But Truman was certainly a he was a New Dealer. I think. But Truman at the same time he was um he was he 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 wanted to accomplish things that. Roosevelt hadn't accomplished. One of the most important of these was to try to get national health insurance for this country. He was he was very aware that Roosevelt had that's something Roosevelt had not done. And seven months after he took office in 1945, Truman Truman tried offered to try to made a speech trying to get a, trying to get a national health program. He tried it again in 1947, which was not a good time to try. That was after he'd after the Democrats had lost the midterms. But then he, but then in 1949, after after the after after he won his first full term, he tried again and made a really good pitch for a national health program again. It didn't pass, but it but but he but he pushed and pushed for it. And it's um, and and a lot what he a lot of what he said. He basically, he said a country that is this wit that is this rich, uh, you, you know, it should be able to provide guaranteed health care for its for its citizens. And if, and even though it was shot down, the the American Medical Association, which was which was a much more powerful lobbying organization, then spent millions of dollars on. Um, I guess in, in, in today's money to try to st- head it off again, um, it, when Truman, Truman started in, 19, in 1950 before the Korean War began, and 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 it was shut down again. So it it never really, uh, he, Truman began a co- sort of committee to study it, and it didn't really come back again till till till, till Medicare till till um, 19 till, till that was passed in 1965. It was interesting about Lyndon Johnson, as you may know, when Medicare was passed, he had the, he signed it in Independence, Missouri. Right. With Truman, Harry Truman, and Best Truman by his side, and they got the first two Medicare cards, one and two. And in Truman's last days, by the way, he was in a hospital in Kansas City, and he was in a private, semi-private room. It was paid for fifty-nine dollars a day, <laughs> uh, mostly paid for by Medicare. Harry Truman is, it seems to me, fairly well known for a courageous decision he made in the aftermath of the Second World War to desegregate the U.S. Armed Forces. Talk, if you would, though, about his larger attitudes toward race relations in the United States um, in the, what was, after all, a period of some ferments uh, that would l- lay the groundwork for the uh, more active civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Yeah, I mean, Truman, Truman's views on race were really, really interesting. He was, a, he was the, he, you know, his family were, were he was a he was a son of or a grandson or great grandson of the of the Confederacy, and that was his that was his background, and he um, he wasn't a, a racist because that's because that, that he wasn't a that wasn't the way he he thought but he but he he, he used the N word that was part of his speech he certainly said publicly in, in other speeches he, he thought that there will never be social equality between the races, but at the same time he was very much aware. Of of uh, that there, there was injustice being done, and he became really for the first time really affected by these stories of of beatings in this, and 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 lynchings in the South. That really got to him. There was one very horrible case where he where his, a man Isaac, Isaac Sergeant Isaac Woodard was intentionally blinded by a by a Southern I, I think it was a sheriff or a or or or. A, or, or just another sort of lawman, blinded, blinded. But when he said something to um, that, that that offended him, and that that became a, and that really offended Truman too. And that's when he got together uh, in front of the Lincoln Memorial and made us and uh, with 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 hated it with enemies of the South, such as Eleanor Roosevelt and Walter White, the head of the double N, the NAACP, and and Justice Black, and um, and said and said something. This we 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 will we really will. Um, it is time for a change. It is time. It is time to guarantee, uh, to 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 give everyone a, this, the chance for opportunity for to, to and to, to succeed in this country, and 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 he meant it. And Walter White was impressed by others, and others were impressed. And he really did mean it. And he introduced a, what was then a fairly 
there, fairly strong civil rights law I proposed it took to Congress, and it was it was strong enough that uh, that uh, in the 1948 convention, much of the South walked out and led in fact to a to a breakaway uh, a breakaway third party against Truman. Is about it's true that Truman gave the order to desegregate the military. That didn't take a that took it was an order. It didn't happen. It took a, Eisenhower made it happen, but Truman did that too. And all these things really alienated the South. I'm always I was always struck. Truman gave an interview to Arthur Crock, the bureau chief of the New York Times. And he said there, you must remember there are always two people sitting in this office, and one of them is Harry Truman, and one of them is the president of the United States. And when it came to, when it came to certain decisions like race relations, that was the president of the United States speaking. So whatever his personal feelings about, you know, about integration and so on, he, he understood that something that he was the leader of all the people, and something more was right. needed, and he brought that something. That's what that's really admirable, I think, because he went against his everything that he was that embedded in him, and yet he did the right thing. That's a fascinating distinction between yeah, the man yeah. and the and the president. By um, way, some of that, I think, was, some of that, by the way, I think, I don't know how you would feel about it, but mm-hmm. some of that was also true of, of Lyndon Johnson, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so who Agreed. was brought up in that sort of environment and yet knew knew, knew what was demanded of, of a presidency. Absolutely. I think that's a, yeah. a great observation. Um, so, you know, Harry Truman wins this, uh, famously wins the surprise election of 1948, but by 1952, his poll numbers are very low. Clearly, his popularity is flagging. What why was it that in those final months he was really losing whatever traction he had with the American people? It was everything. It was first place. Mm-hmm. The Korean War was a big part right. of it. Um, it was. Um, it, it was. It, it was. Everyone could see it was a losing war, and it was unlike the, the Vietnam War. There, there was. There wasn't. There wasn't the sort of anger on anger on the campuses. There was. We never had a war like that, so there was nothing. We 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 didn't know any better then. But that was part of it. Part of and part of it was. Was was the sort of aura of corruption that was everywhere. Truman was uh, Truman was not a corrupt person, but a lot of the people around him were not were, were a little bit slipshod about it. Uh, one of his top aides had arranged to have deep freezes, which was sort of a luxury item, sent to a number of people, including best best Truman. Uh, there were there were there were stories of mink coats being given to uh, by by lobbyists to White House personnel and so on. And then the the Bureau of of, of Internal Revenue. Um, uh, was 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 uh, being affected by by bribes. It was that was that that and there again that wasn't that wasn't Truman's fault necessarily, but it was happening under his watch. It got so bad that at one point Truman brought in a, what is it called? It's basically a special uh, prosecutor, mm-hmm. and uh, and and uh, and a guy a, a guy named Newbald Morris who was who couldn't have been less suited for the job. He was a New York sort of a New York Roosevelt Republican, good government Republican who who was totally unprepared for this. His last night in New York, he went to the opera. He was part of the opera board and said, he wrote in his memoir, I had, a, I had, a, I had an ominous feeling that this might not go well. And it didn't go well. He became he, he became a sort of Javert asking for the names and, and, and financial records of everyone working in the Justice Department. And that didn't, and that really annoyed Truman's, uh, <laughs> Truman's secretary. Uh, the Attorney General was... Wanted nothing to do with him, and at one point they, they, they were so angry at each other that 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 Truman's attorney general, who was a friend of Truman's, fired Newbold Morris, which left Truman in the position of having to fire his attorney general. And this all and this all happened almost within 24 hours. And this it was a and all this thing did not help Truman's image. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was then there was a steel strike, which which uh, which probably didn't have to happen, but it but it was it was a strike the the the, the strikers. Uh, over wages, a usual thing, but then Truman seized the steel plants, uh, 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 make it a, as, a, as a government emergency. He had the authority as president to, to seize the steel industry, and that became a big Supreme Court case. Truman was sure he would win. How could he lose? No. All, every justice was either appointed by him or by, or by President Roosevelt. The chief justice was his pal, Fred Vinson. But as it turned out, he could lose, and they, he lost by six to three. You can't do this. You can't have. You don't have this sort of power. And it was that was those were the days when the Supreme Court was in a more independent body than it, perhaps it is today. And uh, and one of the one of the justices, Justice Robert Jackson, one of Roosevelt's appointees, said, compared what Truman had done, he said, that's the sort of thing that King George <laughs> would do. And Truman was Truman. That was not Truman. It did not make Truman happy. And all this together. Basically, basically, and so Truman would say, say that oh, if I if I ran, I would win, but he knew he wouldn't, and and nobody could have beaten Eisenhower, and mm-hmm. and who was who was going to inevitably, well, not actually not inevitably, but but if Eisenhower was the Republican nominee, no one no one could have beaten him, and uh, and no one could beat him. As we look back over the 
Truman presidency, are there any particular lessons or implications um, in your book that you think we would do well to remember in our own politically challenging time in 2022? Yeah, I mean, I think what the, the thing we should really remember, I think the thing we, we what we love about Truman today is is his 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 sense of understanding what this job is, understanding it's 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 debt to history, understanding he he loved the Constitution. I'd like to find I, I wrote something down that he wrote. Oh, I'm not going to find it in this. Oh, sorry. Oh, I can't find it. But, but anyway, he 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 got a letter from a school schoolboy school. Boy, school School girl saying, asking about asking about the the, the 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 presidency, and Truman said, "We can't take this democracy for granted. We can't take it for granted, just as just as the Greeks couldn't, just as the Romans couldn't." And 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 he really he 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 really says say he really loved the Constitution and he loved its history and he loved and that's something that we've that we we I think we more and more appreciate. He realized how fragile it all is too and that's something and 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 how and how important it was to protect it and i say we all these things we probably wouldn't i wouldn't put such an emphasis on it had we not been through what we've been through the last few years but that's something we 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 value more and more in truman this is something we should we people these men and women who value what this country is who want to protect its values that's something 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 that we should that we treasure and we treasure and that's we treasure in harry truman Jeffrey Frank, thank you so much for making time to be with us on With the Bark Off, and congratulations again on The Trials of Harry S. Truman. Thank you so much for having me. It was really my pleasure to be there. My thanks to our sponsors, the Moody Foundation and St. David's Healthcare, and as always to you for joining us. If you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm Mark Lawrence. See you next time.